staff at aged care facilities as well and acknowledge their role. So I'd be happy to have those conversations off board. Um, this isn't a one size fits all, it's a balancing act. Um, it's a balancing act of the respecting the wishes of the residents. Each resident may be in a very different circumstance. There may be some that are in um, palliative care stages where they've got underlying you know, cancer and their life is life limited. And it's a question of what does that individual person want? Um, and that's why, I, you know, at the heart of decision making, I really um, can't be stronger than saying it has to be about the care for the, re you know, care for the residents and their wishes. I I'm very happy to dispute, but just to let you know that the, all of the issues such as cohorting, removal from the facility, removing clean people. But in terms of talking to the infectious disease specialist at the time, one of his comments was if the facility had have been um, decanted day one, then you would have misallocated a large number of people because of the incubation period um, and actually put people together that actually had the infection. And so there are challenges with um, whatever response we have. We have to balance risks and benefits and we have to place the interest of residents at the heart of our decision making. And the doctors and the epidemiologists and the Anglicare and the Commonwealth have regular daily meetings and all plans are on the table. Jim, but generally speaking, if, if somebody in an aged care facility is well boosted for a while, would you advocate if they wanted to, to, to get out of a facility like that? That, op that option is available to everyone. Depending on whether they've been designated as a contact, there would have to be those arrangements. So if they wanted to go home to a fa their family, and they were a contact of the case, we would have to make sure everyone was fully understanding of what isolation meant um, and that those, you know, we had monitoring in place for 14 days. So it goes, it applies to everyone has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis and we need to make sure everyone is fully aware of the care requirements um, for whatever option is taken. Are there any cases where healthy residents from March have been assisted in quarantine at a hospital? Um, I'm not aware of those circumstances, um, but I'd be happy to follow that up. Ms. Angray is moving uh, the COVID negative residents into another section of the facility so that near the other COVID negative residents. Why is that only happening now? Is that good stuff? If you're asking the wrong person, yes, I'll ask Dr. Chen. So there is one wing in the facility which. Um, has um, been kept as a sort of clean wing where um, that the testing is ongoing in that wing but there has not been COVID cases to date amongst the residents in that wing. There had to be um, sufficient cleaning of the rooms um, and to allow the reorganisation between the two other wings of the facility to facilitate the movement of, of patients. And so there has to be extensive terminal cleaning movement and has to be sufficient staff to safely move residents. So it is a is a both a function of the cleaning and getting the staff on board and having sufficient staff to move the patients um, safely because we wouldn't want to, we'd want to do any movement of people that had COVID in the facility very carefully so as not to um, contaminate any other areas of the facility. Is that, is that a reorganisation, Dr. Chan? Is it the sick people that go here in the, the negative that, that's right. That's one of the principles where you um, try and keep one section of the facility. So all, all aged care facilities are designed differently. Um, for instance, they might be particular units that are closed and in, a, in this sort of situation what you try and do is make sure that only the nurses working in um, an infected area were working with infected patients and you keep those people from rotating anywhere else, notwithstanding they're wearing personal protective equipment. So these are some of the principles of control that would be put place, in place generally um, within facilities and it really depends on the configuration of those facilities. That was um, actually raised by um, a person to me in an email yesterday actually and I've referred that no, that's not what we're thinking. Um, this this disease is most likely spread through the contact, you know, the contact proportions, you know, droplets, contamination of surfaces, those being indirectly. As I said, the, <clears throat> the process of donning and doffing um, is um, the, the putting the, the PPA on is, is a simpler aspect, but certainly care needs to be placed in in doffing. And we're actually just discussing some of the mm -hmm. the. Um, the challenges that when you read the literature, even in um, the SARS 
Ebola, um, how important it is mm -hmm. to actually have that support yeah. for people dining and docking, um, in particular docking, um, because of that inadvertent human nature to touch your face or dislodge stuff. So that's why um, that strength and presence there to really support the healthcare staff um, with the infection control is going to be um, enhanced.
happens, the health staff, public health staff and also frontline staff are learning from the experience. But as I said, this is, this is, when we first started talking about this virus, we called it the novel coronavirus, the new coronavirus. It's a novel situation, it's a difficult situation, and we can't expect perfection. This is, this is not black and white, this is medicine and science at the cutting edge, and staff who are working at that. So I just want to thank the staff, I want to thank everybody who's actually been working together so well. Would you like to thank the federal colleagues? Uh, Richard Colbeck's been amazing, available on the phone. Peter Dutton, amazing on the phone. Um, to me, supporting uh, the New South Wales efforts. And uh, I also just want to thank Anglicare in the sense of whilst we might have differences of opinion about the style of communication that I might have liked, um, I'm just perhaps me. <laughs> My communication might be a bit different from them. They're running a big, a big uh, retirement uh, facility there that uh, has a capacity, I think, for, I think it was 102 people from memory. So it's a big facility and they've been doing a bit. With that, I want to thank you all again um, for coming today and hopefully we'll all look forward to seeing the day when we get to zero cases. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to you. You're watching Sky News COVID-19, working alongside Sky News Live. We're here to provide you comprehensive coverage of the coronavirus crisis. Real news when you need it most. Well, thank you very much for coming out this afternoon. I just wanted to start this conference by sending a great big thank you to our teachers who've been working so hard in such extraordinary circumstances to uh, prepare our kids for learning from home. Most teachers have been working right through the school holidays to get ready for term two so that they can really support their students with online and distance education. It's been very hard and they've done a wonderful job. I also want to send a shout out to the parents who've been helping their kids at home. It's not easy, I can tell you, it's really not easy. Um, we, we know that these are extraordinarily difficult times and what doesn't help is mixed messaging from the Commonwealth Government. Just hang on for a sec. Sorry, the wind's just making my eyes a bit watery. Um, what doesn't help is mixed messaging from the Commonwealth Government. A few weeks ago, Scott Morrison was saying, listen to your state premiers when it comes to sending your kids back to school. And this morning, we saw the Federal Education Minister sending the most confusing messages to parents about uh, sending their kids to school, saying that they should do so immediately. This is a very difficult and stressful time for families. Families are doing the very best they can uh, in extraordinary, unprecedented circumstances. And to have a big political fight between the states and the Commonwealth when it comes to schooling is the very last thing they need. At this difficult, stressful time, parents should be listening to their state premiers about schooling. In every part of Australia, the states have made clear that if parents have to work, they can send their kids to school. If kids are educationally disadvantaged, they can send their kids to school. Uh, and beyond that, we don't need the, the Federal Education Minister trying to bully and harass state education ministers and state governments. most disappointing thing. States and territories have been working so well with the Commonwealth Government in so many areas. There's been cooperation and really that's what Australians want to see. We're all worried about our health, we're all worried about our kids' education and what we uh, respond to as parents is getting uh, one set of advice about the right thing to do. Everybody wants to see kids back in the classroom as quickly as possible. We know that the best thing for kids is learning in the classroom when they can. What we don't want is the mixed messages about whether it's safe or not. Do you agree that keeping some schools open Oh, absolutely. Look, I think it's very clear that um, vulnerable children will be disadvantaged by not being in the classroom. But the educational disparities that the federal government's pointing to, they yeah, existed yeah. long before COVID-19 became an issue in Australia. And in fact, this federal government has re
reduced funding growth in public education. So this federal government has actually ensured that no public school will ever meet its fair funding level, and yet every non-government school will. If the government is really concerned about educational if the federal government is really concerned about educational disadvantage, then it should properly fund all schools based on need. They're not doing that. So you'll excuse me uh, for being a little bit sceptical about their newfound interest in disadvantaged students. This is the government that restored funding it had cut to Catholic and independent schools, but kept the funding cuts to public schools. Well, what's been made very clear by the medical advice is that uh, it, it is possible and indeed necessary to interpret that medical advice uh, based on the specific circumstances of each state and territory. The Deputy Chief Medical Advisor has been very clear about that. So it, it doesn't make sense to have the same approach in South Australia, which hasn't had um, any transmission of COVID-19 for weeks, as it, as it is in Victoria or New South Wales, where there is still active transmission of the virus. You need to take a state-by-state, territory-by-territory approach. Uh, that makes sense. What doesn't make sense is sending parents mixed messages about this, the, the one state or territory where the, the Prime Minister and the Premiers are getting completely different um, absolutely opposed messages about what parents should be doing. It is hard enough being a parent uh, supporting your children in learning at home. If, you, if you're getting different messages from your Premier and your Prime Minister about what happens next.